and yeah, so uh, so today isn't going to be. I uh, hope it hasn't been missold. It's not machine vision exactly. It's more um, image. Oops, I was trying to minimise that. It's more image processing, uh, classical image processing using OpenCV and some vegetative indices. Uh, and what we're trying to do is uh, what we're looking at now. Hopefully, we're all looking at the same thing. Is a uh, aerial shot of a blueberry farm. So these are polytunnels. Yeah. Uh, he has got outdoor plants as well, but um, what yeah. what this guy is able to do is he's able to uh, bring mm. blueberries to the supermarkets a couple of weeks mm. more uh, earlier than any any of the other um, local producers because he's got um, heating in his tunnels. He uses he, his ground source heat pump, and he's He's very up to date. Every latest technology he uses, and he get he commands a terrific premium for doing that in the in the thousands of pounds a ton to get these things early into the shops. Anyway, so to cut a long story short, um, we are working in one of these polytunnels. Uh, can you see my uh, mouse? I hope so. I'm going along the sort of top left yeah, one. We, and, we can um, see it. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, we're we're using probably about half of this tunnel. I'm not sure exactly what it is. About 75 or 100 meters or something. So that's the that's the outside. Uh, this is looking endwards into a polytunnel. If anybody's familiar with strawberries or indeed raspberries, um, it, it, often they're they're grown in this way. Um, they're they're sort of sheltered and so on. Um, and what we're doing here, this is Phil. He he owns the farm, and all all these uh, plants are actually in pots. Um, so there's the sort of central bit at the middle where the tractor can drive up and down and do spraying or whatever. And the pots are off to one side. And things to note in this picture are just behind me, you, you see this vertical pole, this galvanized, looks like a scaffolding pole. Well, on that, it's got a little cross piece here. And actually, there are wires strung between these poles. There's a pole here, pole here, pole here. And the idea of these wires is that the blueberry plants have got something to hang on to and they can sort of tuck them behind, keep them neat for the pickers to come along and pick the blueberries when, when the time comes. Um, and we're taking advantage uh, of this setup. And what, in fact, what, what we're looking to do is, is we're looking to uh, automatically monitor these plants. So normally you would have somebody called a fieldsman who would walk up and down every day checking that the irrigation hasn't failed, looking for pests uh, or, or all sorts of maladies. Um, but what we're doing here is on top onto the right hand side we've still got these vertical poles but you'll see there's an extra rail running along the top here and and this is where railbot will be driving along this is railbot on its rail uh, it, it drives along and it's got a camera just here which is um an improvised multi-spectral camera and these four things are lamps they're tungsten halogen and they've been chosen because they give a, a full spectrum of, well, it's not really a full spectrum, it doesn't go very far into the blue, but it's a, a steady curved spectrum of light, sort of more, yeah, similar to sunlight, um, particularly down in the infrared region, which we're, we're quite interested in. Uh, this is a little close up of how it's propelling itself along the bar, looking from underneath. Uh, you get a bit of a closer look here as well at the window where the where the camera is. These are the sorts of pictures it's taking. Uh, so this is its view looking down. There are those wires I was talking about before that they're able to, you know, hook the plant into. Uh, and in fact, the, the field of view of the camera is is greater than than needed. Uh, so in fact, there's one pot here, which is the uh, you know, we're interested in, there are 50 plants in total, I'll come to the experimental design in a minute, um, but this is one pot, there's another pot here, you can't see the pots, but there is overlap in the branches, so what we actually have to do is we, we crop and zoom the image, so um, the, the images you'll see us working with later on look more sort of like that, and if you can imagine just the centre of this image cropped out and this is a sort of level of detail that we're able to achieve um, this is an old image so these are actually flowers on here not berries but they will become berries and 
that journey from becoming a, a fruit to a berry is, is something we're interested in for fruit uh, you know, yield forecasting to uh, guide the pickers along to the ripe fruits in the tunnel. So that's a, a, a visible light taken at night. I'll, I'll come into that about why we're doing it at night uh, a little bit later, but that's um, a picture taken with the lamps at midnight and that's in the visible spectrum, a red, green and blue, and that's in the infrared. So in fact, it takes two separate pictures uh, with two different lenses and I'll, I'll show you how it flicks through those later on. And just out of interest, this is inside of uh, the, the Braille, but as it was being developed, uh, this side of it is uh, to do with drive. So you can see a sort of a pulley here and a belt and a motor and some boards. There's a little Raspberry Pi and a little Arduino up here and so on. So that's what's inside. On the other side is the camera and the battery. It takes a big motorcycle battery to power it and uh, it does its missions. It does it uh, twice a day and um, it does it by battery power. So it goes back to its little charging station. So um, experimental design, um, just quickly go back to this picture to describe the layout. So uh, up here was the, the the row we're interested in. And what there are, there are 50 plants um, all in a row. The picture's taken from the doorway of the uh, polytunnel. So um, they're, they're numbered in 50 and they're broken up into into five treatment groups. So let me quickly show you what that entails. So we've got uh, plants here numbered one through to 50. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're broken up twice and I might get Ed to step in to sh explain how he, because uh, he gave me a little bit of our script to work out where to, how to sort of randomize it so that um, being close to one end of the polytunnel didn't uh, confer an advantage on a particular group but the, there's five treatments um, and, and what we're doing is we're um, control would be ideal so uh, it's got the, just the right amount of water the right amount of what's that iron um, EC I, I, I wouldn't I won't pretend to know what all of these things are but all I know is that there's four four ways we're torturing the plant and one control and that's spread out. And uh, so they're in groups. There's 50 plants in uh, and there's five treatments. So there's 10 plants in each group. And what Ed did, he did it in such a way that each group has got. So if you look at group one, you'll see that it's got two candidate plants from each of the treatments. But there is still a random element. So if you, did you just quickly want to say something about that? Ed, because I appreciated you sending me the R script, but didn't uh, wouldn't feel confident to explain how it worked. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, this was just to to randomize the allocation of individual plants to the groups, but we wanted to block the design because of the. Um, suspected different conditions at the end of the uh, polytunnel. This might be part of the story that you'll tell us mm, about because yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a suspicion that that was a correct uh, fear. And it was just to, to uh, allocate a balanced number of plants for each treatment to each of the blocks. That's it. Okay. Thank you. OK, that's good. There was a name you used. Was there a name you used for that? It wasn't the Latin squares or something, was it? No, it's a uh, it's a randomized stratified design. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's <laughs> there it is in a nutshell. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so um, so so what's actually happens? I, I, I mentioned it. We do it twice a day. Having then previously said, oh, we capture the pictures at night. Not strictly true. We're capturing the pictures twice. Uh, so the fortunately, there's a uh, Wi-Fi on the uh, farm. So as soon as the pictures are taken, we're not saving them. Uh, to a memory stick or something like that, because the idea is this is going to run unattended all the way through the, the season, right through till the autumn, because we're not just interested in the fruit, we're also interested in the well-being of the bushes and how will they grow afterwards. So uh, what we see here is um, if I run this, you'll see this is this will then collect 
here we go. So it's connecting to my FTP server, which is the same FTP server, which the Raspberry Pi was sending the images to. And this is what it's sending. So this has come from today, a little log to say that the last time it uh, finished an upload was uh, 2.39 this afternoon. And it, it's got two images for each plant. So plant one has got a, um, a visible and a near infrared image um the plant two and so on all the way through to 50. Uh, now that's during the day <laughs> at night you'll see now we've got another set here that uh, that finished recording at two o'clock in the morning and it's exactly the same thing we've got plant one visible and near infrared and i'll just very quickly show you what this looks like it's a sort of a sneak preview of what's coming up later so um this is uh, this is a daytime image and this is a nighttime image um now the reason that we use uh, we, we're going to the trouble of doing this at night is that we want to have control over as much as, as we can so um I, I won't explain yet what these images are across the top but you will notice that the, the these three which are from the daytime these are from the same nighttime below you'll notice uh, here for example the the yellow which shows the verdancy of the plant how green it is how much chlorophyll there is at this point seems to be different in the left hand image um which is which is a bit strange because if you look at the nighttime images you can't see any difference at all you know it's almost as though they're all exactly the same picture and that's a, a testament to to how little noise there is in the system because we're controlling the amount of light the um exposure time of the image so so whilst this daytime image here uh it, it could have been in, in sunshine, it could have been in cloud, it could have been heavily overcast, and it will affect the results of the experiment. That's that's why we've done it. Um, but I'm capturing two complete data sets because that's actually only my theory. I mean, it's my experience too, but it could be that we could run a trial. I mean, it's interesting <laughs> to note that um, although um, we've got these two different things, this, this number, which is just an arbitrary health score, uh, was very level 94 95 94 and so was this one that's i mean it's different range because of the different amount of light but 75 77 75 so and and the one that looks less green or uh, would appear to be on the left uh i think it's by chance because actually you you can see that in these images at the top we're seeing some of the background here this is like a polythene layer on the ground Whereas uh, because I've been able to control the light here, I've been able to completely exclude everything that isn't leaves. So that's the that's the thinking behind it. How did we get the different images? I'll show you a part of the robot and what we've got here. I'm, I don't know if this will work, hopefully. I don't know if you see it moving, but what we've got there is a Raspberry Pi camera uh, on the bottom red plate sorry for the camera work it's a bit wobbly and there's a little servo motor that's switching two lenses band pass lenses so the left one is uh, visible light only and the one on the right is infrared light only and that that's why when we look at the uh, uh, look at the images we're capturing we've got visible and near infrared and what we do then with those is we, um, uh, we're, 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 the, the theory was or is still, we, we, it hasn't uh, been proven either way, is that you can tell the uh, health of the plant or, or for example, if, if it's not being watered properly or something, you should see that it, it becomes less green. Now, <laughs> uh, that hasn't been our experience up till now so this is what what you're seeing here is each of the plants um plant one up by the door through to plant 50 down here and you can see they're all quite different um you know plants being what they are um but the the, the key to, to to the you'll see that they've been allocated this health scores here so plant um 
42 uh, on the 12th of uh, June uh, was allocated a score of 112. What that actually means is that of the leaves that are av available, i.e. we're ignoring the, the blue, dark blue background, of the leaves that are available, how, how much of the NDVI vegetative index uh, are we seeing? And when you do NDVI, for anybody who isn't familiar, I'll just quickly show you how, how that works. Uh, uh, wiki NDVI shortcut. Uh, it's quite simply a, a formula and it's widely used um, from satellites and so on. Um, and and all, all it is, is that you take uh, the red channel of RGB uh, and a near infrared, uh, the same pixel, but in, in you know, in a, in a different color plane, and you just do image arithmetic on it. So all of these numbers will be, um, I was going to say, they'll all be between zero and 255, but yeah. actually yeah, just, just, uh, you end up with, <laughs> you do end up with negative numbers. So you do have to normalize it afterwards. Look down here, it says by design, uh, you end up with a number between minus one and plus one, and then you just do some uh, you know, simple uh, Python type stuff, and you end up with a grayscale image, which you can then uh, um, uh, colorize using a color map just for our just for our human benefit, just so that we can pick out the parts that are really nice and green, which are the red parts, versus you know, going through yellow down to blue, uh, so blue would not be very poor. And the way I've arrived at these simple scores, so for example, um, let's just find one. So here, 98, 100, 101, uh, is, is simply by, um, how did I do it? Oh, it's the average pixel intensity uh, of the green leaf areas. It, it's, it's really that simple. Um, and, and what we have discovered, and I'll, I'll show you more clearly, because I showed this to the farmer, because th I thought, oh, this is great. You'll be able to spot things happening. It turns out you really can't, you know, unless you, you're very observant, you might not be able to spot the difference between 98 and 103. Uh, so so what he said was, well, can you present this, you know, visualise this data in a better way? So he's, he's he was absolutely right. And later I'll, uh, I'll show you how we did that. Um, let's have a look. Uh, and in the eye, uh, day and night, yeah. So, so at, at this point, we moved on to um, R. You'll be glad to hear, the data people will be glad to hear. And, and what I did is, um, I put, uh, I made a, a data file, a simple data file, which was, um, this which I haven't got the headers on it because uh, I just haven't but it's but it's got all of every single image has got the the health uh, what treatment it was um, and I've also put the uh, the actual leaf area within the image as well just in case that becomes significant later on for the for the growth of the plant and when we did that and I went to just a second whilst our studio resumes. Yeah, but yeah, definitely. Okay, so, um, so when I did that, I was able to plot for each uh, treatment. So, for example, this is the control. Uh, this is the average health of all the plants in the control group over time. And you'll see that, generally speaking, it's, it's sort of getting better and better as the plants growing, because they started as small plants in pots and they're, you know, they're enjoying the spring and summer now, finally coming. Um, quite interesting that... Uh, the, and, and of course, as well as the average for the whole group, you can see the individual 10 individual plants in each one, which 
I, yeah. I find interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and what we were able to spot is that poor old plant yeah. 18 here is having a is having a shocking time of it. Uh, it's not dead yet. It's sort of just coming back. Um, and, I, and, and so I showed this to the farmer and he said, oh, well, that's great. You know, you can see group by group. So there's low iron. Um, you know, so there's low iron, there's control, uh, high EC. Um, but of course, then you're probably all thinking the same as he was. Well, that's great, but we want to compare the groups. So the, the last thing was we ignored charts that were able to show the individual yeah, plants and we showed uh, the comparison of uh, average. And uh, so very interestingly, uh, right, so there's actually, there is a, an outlier in this data, and I did look back and it, it is a bad, <laughs> bad piece of data. We, we but apart from that, uh, we've been getting completely regular readings from the system, which I'm very thrilled about. Um, the, the, but what's weird is that we did have a um, an event, uh, an unplanned event where uh, the all of the treatments except control um, lost water uh, for a couple of days, and we were really expecting this is this is why on uh, on, be, on here be, well, we uh, marked this. This was the day after um, there has been. Was that after? Well, it was it was it was over this period. Um, there was there was a severe water shortage. This this period, believe it or not, with these. Um, you know, health numbers and um, heat maps and everything. Mm -hmm. It just shows actually how you can't tell. If you look at these, you know, okay, it goes from 124 yeah, to 131. Well. This represents the same period. Right? And it, it, it was shocking to me. It's this period, believe it or not, in encompasses this huge jump here. Um, and, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, this, this dip, here, this actual day here, where all the plants went down, it's it's remarkable they're all doing the same thing. There are confounding factors that we're not taking into account. We think it's probably temperature. It's either probably temperature or the sunlight during the day before. Um, but it's remarkable how they're all moving more or less in step. So this dot here was uh, was where I put the star. And this is where uh, what Ed was alluding to earlier. We did finally notice something interesting um, in the images. And I don't know if you will be able to spot it. I, I spotted it because I spend a lot of time staring at these. Uh, but if you look here on this third image, you'll see this is blue, which means that it's less less green or less active chlorophyll uh, or for whatever reason isn't registering as strongly in the ndvi vegetative index um and i thought oh that's that's interesting i'll i'll sort of follow it through and you can sort of see the same thing if you look carefully uh very carefully you see the big drops even if you can't see you can see the big drops in number i mean this is a colossal drop from 95 to 84 and this one 83 to 75 and so on. But as you go through, you get halfway through and suddenly that effect has uh, completely gone. And it sort of uh, points toward um, temperature being a big thing, possibly the end of the um, the end of the polytunnel wasn't closed during the night or something of that nature, because it because plant one is 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 right up there by the door. So um what we are planning to do uh mike who's on the project as well is um he's he's got a lot of uh sensors in the pot that he's registering he's registering the um what's he measuring the, the amount of moisture and temperature so we're hoping to bring those in and see whether we can um you know pluck a little bit more out to explain this variation and uh, in fact i have shown this to ed already and he 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 was saying yeah we, yeah we could also bring in other stuff for example um if it is to do with sunshine well then we can bring in the you know the nasa weather data for the area and then we can start to do a little bit more data crunching and uh, try and work out um you know what's what's uh, contributing what's contributing to the effect uh so that was using up. So that was one goal of the project. The other thing that the 
farmer in particular is interested in is uh, ripeness of fruit. Um, so there's lots of people doing ripeness of fruit or, or fruit forecasting. Uh, so I'm sort of shying away from it a little bit um, because well, the history of it is that most of the um, companies and universities that have looked at harvesting well, strawberries it's, it's, and, and so on have got these robots going up and down. They yeah. found that it's actually really, really difficult to harvest strawberries. Yeah, they and they've thought, oh, well, if we stick cameras on, we can do fruit forecasting. And there's several startup companies are doing this. Uh, whether they're doing it with um, blueberries, I don't know. I could look into it. But uh, but uh, so, so I've made a little data, a pipeline of um, how you could potentially do this using OpenCV, and uh, I'll show you the result. Probably show you the results first, and then explain how they're achieved. So it may be not. It may Yeah. So so here here is. Uh, an image we're not using infrared although it, it, it maybe we should you know there's experimentation to be done there um and i've, I've um segmented out um using you know uh, thresholding this and threshold a, a bit of a manual process to be honest i wasn't very proud of myself i did get the berries out of it and then what i did similar to how we uh, took the average of the um uh, intensity of the NDVI grayscale image to give a health score. What what I've done is is convert the image into a different color space called HSV. And what what that means is that instead of then having a We're red, green, and blue channel in your image, you then have a hue, saturation, and value channel. Uh, and what what hue means in this case it's it means the color thing it, it it's it's a it's described if you were to google hsv you would see mostly you would see a color wheel that goes round and it goes round from sort of well it goes around in a circle and they've just so happened to stick zero right in the middle of the red hue now you, the observant amongst you will yes. have noticed that there aren't 180 degrees in the circle, but um, the reason that when you're using OpenCV and you use HSV that they use 180 is because you can't fit 360 into a, an 8-bit number. You can only go to 255, so they simply divide by 2 and just have a slightly lower resolution. So, so uh, so this this in the middle here, this sort of I don't know how you would describe it, probably um, aquamarine or whatever. At, at at eighty would be one hundred and sixty in another system. Uh, but but what but what we're seeing then is that of those pixels that do represent berries, the this is the uh, a um, normalized frequency of where they find themselves in the hue color space so you see that if we sort of drew a line down here this color where i'm sort of going around now represents this color so if i were to go to a ripe berry and i don't seem to have one open let me just quickly go to the uh probably find it in a minute robotic fieldsman presentation uh, ripeness two. So this is um, a week or so on, and what we're seeing now is, oh, in fact, I can show you down in. Um, I'll show you the code in a minute. But I've done the same thing again here, but now you can see some of the berries are a little bit more blue. You see they're blue here, and the histogram has moved up from down here, which was green. Let me switch between them to that's where it was. And now it's 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 up here. So the steps taken to do this uh, were done in Python with OpenCV. Um, you'll see this a lot if you're doing anything with image processing. You'll you'll see import CV to and import NumPy as MP, and that's because um, images which are just arrays of numbers. Wow are represented as arrays, uh, MP arrays. Um, so 
just quickly step through here what's happened we've um uh, we've read read an image uh, it's it's into a three-dimensional matrix the red green and blue layers we've split it into its individual color channels and then uh, in order to do this segmentation to get the uh, get the berries out as it were uh, that, not that one here I, I've used various logic I've said well if a pixel if any one pixel uh, is let me see what the logic is that I used uh, if any one pixel is uh, uh, more uh, blue than red yeah, you do an exception. Like I said, create a mask where red is greater than just highlighting any of these. Uh, where red or green is greater than blue. Oh, so what I'm doing, I'm doing the opposite. I'm saying that if some, if, I'm trying to get rid of the parts of the image that aren't the part that I want. You see what I mean? Um, so you create a mask of, of zeros. Uh, you overlay that over your original picture, and most of the background disappears. Unfortunately, and this is the sort of fiddle factor that you often get in image processing, I was still seeing some of the background. Um, the reason being that if you look at the original image, uh, down here, for example, the you, you know there's there's things that look blue. <laughs> it's that simple in in the background. So you have to sort of have some discretion in in uh, setting a threshold that that below which everything is cut out um, i can sort of get away with that because i'm in control of the light so all of my pictures look the same i couldn't get away with that using daylight so, images so yeah it is in, it is in, um, it's in progress okay so I'm thankfully not really yeah so we're we're taking uh, cropping it out we're you know we're making our image so that it just contains the berries and then we're converting to um, a different color space so using a, a an open cv function called uh, blue green red to hsv which is exactly what it sounds for some reason uh and you have to be very careful if you're working with open cv their images aren't rgb they're bgr and it causes all sorts of confusion but uh get used to it eventually um and then uh then what have i done uh, yeah just just created it just done the mask again so so that um i'm creating another mask so that i can get the each each of the pixels that remain <clears throat> will have a hue a saturation and a a value uh, in in instantly. Uh, what this what this means is that um, hue. So if something can be red, but something that is pink is also red. It's just a different level of saturation. Um, so and and value just means the brightness of a pixel. So you you've gone from this. How many? How much red is there? How much blue is there? How much green is there? You've gone to something that just describes the hue without uh, any reference you know or, or at least you've separated out the color from the effects of light which is the normal it reason for doing this it makes uh, it makes the it, the processing more robust uh, against um changing illumination and so on um it's yeah and then that, so uh, we we then just just look at uh, the what do we just look at uh, we look at the uh, hue for every remaining pixel and then we plot it out in a in a histogram and that gives us a shape that we see here so uh, just quickly this is this is it so that's the original that's the modified and underneath you can see the histogram and um, what we've got here towards the right will be it gets bluer as it goes to the, or to the right and then it would go red again in the in the um, hue color wheel um, so these the, the peak of it is 
I don't know. Uh, it, it's, it's whatever it sees most of. So the very bluest ones uh, are probably yeah. not many of probably, them. So, for example, where my cross says is at the moment, that to me on my screen, I don't know if it comes to you, is very blue. There's a very blue one up here. But there are more that are sort of, um, yeah, less less ripe. So, no, so what I'm hoping to see is once I manage to get a series of these these images and process them sort of sequentially, I'm hoping to sort of get an animation of uh, a, a histogram moving from uh, green towards blue and becoming narrower. I'm, I'm guessing as all of the berries become the same same colour, but um, I, that's a, a bit a bit like with the health index. This is a bit of a um, just a theory at the moment until it's uh, until it's been proven. So. Yeah, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment and uh, open it up to any questions or observations. Uh, go. Thanks a lot for that, Matt. That was um, very detailed. I, I have some questions, but I'll open it up for yeah, other people. Course, other people first. I've any un, comments or questions for Matt? Nominally responsible for making sure. That Things are reasonably down there. So I will just. I think a question that I have, Matt, is um, wh where's the endpoint in oh, this? No. Uh, what's the scope of the project? The and, uh, is is some data analysis part of it? Are you going to include that? Well, yeah. So the the stated aim of the project, and it's a, it is a sort of a funded project, so we have to sort of stick to it. Is um, is to detect, um, for example, uh, stresses remotely, you know, vi by using vision. I don't know whether we should um, out the other set of people. We, we haven't, I think it's partly because the uh, we got the harvest coming up. Um, <laughs> We haven't been stressing the bushes perhaps as much as we could to really force some changes. But we are, we have, for example, already found that losing water for two days doesn't create the expected sudden dip in, in greenness. So, you know, until, until we really do start hammering, you know, the particular groups, you know, like the low water group, for example, um, you know, we it's, it's difficult to know uh, what, what whether we will find it, it, it is a viable op, you know, option. I'm personally, I, I'm more interested in what what it is that's causing the uh, non not not linearity. But I expected if there was a growth, I expected it to be more or less smooth. But there are clearly some external factors, and uh, I think that's interesting because quite a lot of other. Um, use cases exist for NDVI. So you've got drones going across looking to see, you know, similar things, you know, it has this field got enough nitrogen? Um, is there, you know, what's the water like and so on? And if they're not taking account, potentially might not be taking account of these external factors, they could be getting wildly different things just by the chance of when they happen to go and do their their survey. So that's that's the sort of upcoming data wrangling is to throw in the extra data that we've got, which is the um, temperature along with the soil moisture and probably the uh, radiance. I can't think of any more off the top of my head. Um, and, and One of the things that you said in there made me think of, I, I don't know if you remember a few years ago now, we. We did. Um, you were in. You were part of this, uh, doing that hyperspectral mm. imaging on the plant, on the potato plants, and one of the questions there, w which we never resolved. I, I think our experiment was a lot more modest than than this one, um, and we didn't have the same amount of time series for the pictures. But one of the questions was, does the reflectance or characteristics of the images um, change? as the development of the plant mm. continues and i just wondered if there was any kind of 
something a plant physiologist would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know all about that, uh, because when the plant gets to a certain stage after flowering, that just happens. Yeah, uh, just... well, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, um, I, I've sort of gone on a, a sort of a scattergun approach. Let's capture lots and lots of different data. So, for example, I'll say, oh, we'll capture the ones during the day and then we can look at the flowers and, you know, t flowers turning into berries and all that sort of thing. So we're hopefully getting these data sets that will be multi multi purpose down the line. Um, <clears throat> I forgot what my point was now. It was uh, the question about all the data you're collecting and the developmental state of the plant is like just one other. Oh, yeah. Thing. So, so, yes. Yeah, so, the other, so alongside this, as a sort of a way of um, a little bit calibrating, because NDVI, you know, like when I showed you the daytime one of the nighttime one, NDVI isn't a number that you can, uh, it's not, it's just a arbitrary value almost. Um, in, uh, that said, uh, you you can get a meter. So the the farmer has gone and bought one of these meters that you clip onto a leaf and get a reading. So it's going to be really interesting to see whether we can calibrate um, our system to his system so, and see whether the two are hopefully <laughs> at least correlate. Uh, do, do 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 they correlate linearly? Or, you know or you know, his mind sort of, you know, as it gets darker, his mind shooting up or or showing less than 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 his. And the other thing we're doing at the same time, um, which is more about the sort of general health, because of course the, you've got to look at the different uh, treatments we're giving it, low EC, high EC, iron, and whatnot. Is uh, we're doing sap samples. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the regime of the sap sampling is going to be. It's probably something you'll need to look at again as part of experimental design. But um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so he's like I said before, he's not just worried about the actual crop. He's he's more worried about the the plants continuing to grow and be healthy and just to be able to spot something going wrong without somebody actually having to walk up and down. Thing I was um, going to say is a couple of years ago, I seem to remember you were involved. This was even began before I joined Harper. There was a really clever PhD student who uh, was working on reflectance in plants and all sorts of different reflecting patterns hmm. with you. And uh, he was involved in tuber scan in the early days. And as a matter of fact, he's just been hired as a new lecturer. Oh, with Joseph, yeah, yeah. And he'll be here in a few weeks and he really? would be very interested in this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, we the the whole um, tuber scan from the outset was sort of born of the idea. I mean, two, that two sort of axioms that were thought to be axioms, which were that um, you could detect uh, tubers underground with GPR. That was one given from one set of research, and the other given was that uh, which would or I don't know about given, but Joseph maintained that you could uh, see the growing stems because they were lighter and to be fair it, it that wasn't always true it turned out only to be true for a particular variety at a particular growth stage yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and plus it was difficult to detect depending on the light when you took yeah. the photo so yeah. you know uh, but, yeah, but yes, of, but but same thing, same thing. You know, you you've got to control for all these different things. So I don't even know what um, we as we went up and down those tunnels, there were all sorts of different blueberry brushes. You know, there were early ones and late ones and big leaf ones and little leaf ones. So we're really only scratching the surface of it with this. Uh, and it is only a, I think they call it a research starter. It's just looking at is there something to be looked at. Further along, so yeah. Yeah. Right the thing that made me think of Joseph with it is that um, one, one of his one of his chapters of his thesis that he published was uh, sure about comparing alternative um, sure measures that are that are of reflectance that are like. Yes. Oh, you're right. Yes, because yeah, yeah he he because um, most of the vegetative indices discard blue, you know. Yes. And and but he was saying no, there's something in the blue, and yes. uh, that's right. 
yeah, he was. He would, so my lamps wouldn't have been any good for him. So I was I was lo- looking at a a thing in fact, on YouTube the other day. It's that this this guy called Curious Mark. He does up all these old HP instruments and things. And somebody gave him a spectrometer, and um, it's fantastic the way it worked. But its light source was a halogen, and then they'd chosen halogen for the same reason except that they wanted the blue and absolutely needed the blue. So this halogen would had got a quartz envelope, you know, the glass bubble around the filament was quartz because, of course, quartz lets through blue and ultraviolet uh, ultraviolet light. And they were sort of overdriving it because, of course, the, the hotter you get a, a, a filament, the, you know, the, the, it get, the color temperature goes up as, as at the same time. So... Uh, but yeah, but of course, the sunlight does all that for you, but it's not consistent. It's living under the clouds in Great Britain, what can you say? <laughs> yeah. Doing science is hard. Um, yeah. That's all my questions. I really enjoyed that. Thank you again, Matt. Is there any other question from uh, anyone else before we call it? Yeah, uh, if I may comment, uh, thank you, Matt, for showing the effect of the background. Uh, and that you are doing it in the night. Uh, I doubled a little bit with the uh, so-called crop circle um, <laughs> sensors, and I always had a feeling bordering on certainty <laughs> that uh, the influence of changing colors of the sky, especially when there's mm, clouds and mm, re- you know open sky and that sort of stuff, uh, yeah. is prevalent much more than 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 the, than the its own source of. Uh, light, uh, the data are usually very noisy, uh, you know, they, it's supposed to have some filters, but uh, the, the data is noisy, noisy, mm, and uh, uh, always from now on I'm going to point to your research and show, look, he's doing that in the night, <laughs> <laughs> taking yeah. the pictures in the night. Yeah. Did you say crop circles? <laughs> oh, that's what uh, I, I thought well, it must mean something different. I didn't... Uh... <laughs> If you walk with the sensors long enough, you'll get crop circles. <laughs> That's where they come from. Now now you're exposed, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've been sitting in the dentist chair for about uh, two, two hours just before this meeting, and um, I'm going to call the meeting a little early on, on account of that. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks. A big thanks to Matt. We can, we can do the virtual applause in the reacts. And... Uh, <laughs> We'll see everyone. We'll see everyone next week. All right. Cheerio. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. Ta-da, bit.